and during which he was trained. Would you say that I'm putting it accurately, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Smith? I think, you know, a significant question that has to be asked is, why is this going on, other than the Chinese want to become a superpower? But at the University of Michigan, you, you, you basically have a corporate American climate. It's a business. It's no longer an educational institution. And also, it's a, in, in my opinion, it's an immoral institution. At the University of Michigan, it's not the university that I came to in 1965, but it's a new university where things occur that you would not expect to occur. Uh, plagiarism is rampant. And mischarging of federal grants, et cetera. Okay. So, so we have a climate in which these things will thrive, okay, wrongly going on. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can name dozens of people who have had their research work <clears throat> their intellectual property stolen at the University of Michigan by their boss, by their chaired professor, by the department chair. You go through the channels and nothing really ever happens. Okay? <clears throat> These people end up in the trash heap of history. And, <clears throat> and you have a policy that came out during the Carolyn Finney case where the University General Counsel gave a paper at a Boston meeting saying, yeah, we have a program to trash whistleblowers at the University of Michigan. And so, so we know that if you blow the whistle, like you go and say, no, I'm not going to transfer Trident missile submarine ballistic missile technology to the Chinese, that you're in big trouble right away. And they're going to do various nasty things to you. Okay. Uh, Universities have traditionally had what was called shared governance. That is that the uh, administrative branch and the faculty branch would share the, de the major decisions happening at the university. What's happened over the last 20 years, particularly at the University of Michigan, but at many universities, uh, that, that uh, they have eroded the, um, the rights of faculty, uh, the grievance processes, et cetera, so that the faculty become more and more vulnerable. That makes it easier to retaliate against faculty that dissent. And the University of Michigan has, has become very good at punishing whistleblowers. Uh, you compound that with the fact that the University of Michigan in 1992 lobbied for and was granted the right to have their own police department. So now you have, you ha you have a corporate <coughs> governance instead of a shared governance, and the, corporate, the administrative uh, branch has its own enforcement uh, entity that has the full power of the law. So if, if you're a, you know, Bill and I have, have gone to a couple of events where we've held picket signs to try to protest the university's investments in China and to protest the, uh, the transfer of technology to China. First and Amendment right, First right? Amendment right. Mm -hmm. But in both cases, you know, we were harassed by the university police. In the, in the first case, we were, we were outside a meeting where the university was signing a new uh, joint research agreement with a Chinese university. And so we held our signs. They made sure that they had the uh, campus police come and walk right up uh, past us into the building so we would know that they were there. Then when we took our signs and put them back in, the ca in our car and then went into the building to listen to some of the speeches, they made the, the, pol the police officers stand about 10 feet behind our chairs. And then they had somebody from the public relations department get up and, uh, and read part of the freedom of speech uh, policy of the university, except that the only part they read was the part that they had the right to arrest us, and not that we had free speech. So you know, we were obviously uh, uh, feeling a bit intimidated by that. Uh, then uh, uh, a few weeks later, we went uh, when President Clinton was here to, uh, uh, to speak at a, at a, at a democratic function uh, at the Rackham Graduate College. Uh, Bill and I stood outside with our two little picket signs, and the campus police came up and told us that we were going to have to move on because we weren't allowed to have sticks on our sign. Is it sticks? <laughs> <laughs> we have flimsy little sticks. Uh, and they said, no, no, that was not allowed and, and that we were going to have to move on. And, uh, and later, the same policeman who came and told us that we weren't allowed to have sticks held the door open for a campaign worker who took a whole bunch of, of campaign lawn signs into the building you know, with metal sticks. Uh, so you know, we, we, we did feel like we were uh, singled out and harassed uh, because of uh, you know, what we were protesting. Well, it, it sounds to me like it, it, it changed to a top-down hierarchy with oppression coming from the top right. going down. After we invaded Iraq <clears throat> in 2003, 
my students asked me if I would give a course on weapons because they knew I knew about such things. So I introduced the course on shape charges and explosives and pyrotechnic devices, etc. And for two years I gave a, a full year academic course on things you need to survive in the cruel world. And when Professor Shi came in 2005, one of the first things he did was to cancel this course, uh, which was basically helping Americans to survive in a hostile environment of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, he also canceled the courses on rocket engines <coughs> and jet engines and other military-related technologies. Because if you look at the Chinese, they take a long view of things. I mean, they've been fighting across the uh, Eurasian continent for 5,000 years. And, you know, each one makes their own, their own little contributions. And I had a, a, a course on engines, which had been instituted at the request of the big three, where the students actually took engines apart, put them back together. And he also canceled that course because, you know, if you're going out in the battlefield, you have to know how things really work. So he did his part to make sure that American students were not prepared to serve our nation or to save themselves on, on the battlefield. And then it was very interesting, in 2006, I was going to go to the Chinese air show in Zuha in the fall of the year to look for stolen technologies uh, to see, you know, what they were taking. And uh, a, a, approximately a day and a half before I was going to leave for China, I was dragged out of my office in handcuffs by the campus cops, and I was informed by the, the campus cop in no uncertain terms, we don't want you to go to China and therefore we're going to make we. sure that we can delay you. Yes, and who was we? Someone had obviously told this, this pawn mm -hmm. in the system that, hey, Kaufman has to be stopped from going to China where he's going to see American data that's been stolen and put on Chinese airplanes. So the, the University of Michigan, okay, is basically in cahoots with the Chinese because, as was mentioned earlier, it's financially probably attractive to both the institution and to individuals at the institution. And when you look at our endowment, we have an $8 billion endowment. But in these troubling financial times, okay, somehow that endowment continues to grow. And we ask, you know, what's going on? Uh, at the Board of Regents meeting in April, which was held at the Dearborn campus, we were quite surprised to find uh, about 45 Chinese university presidents who were over here for a short course, executive training, by the University of Michigan. And basically, you know, their social bonding, I would think, okay, mm -hmm. committing themselves to long-term arrangements. And what about the students in our state, okay, who are not receiving such welcoming from, from the University of Michigan? Yeah, and, and uh, when we're not educating the students here in Michigan, when they're not measuring up to to the those grades that you're talking about um, and uh, they aren't getting the training that they need the uh, the university is helping to to initiate this institution over in China so that the technology goes over there they use the technology to establish the manufacturing plants over there for, to, for using that technology and we're just uh, uh, blank out of luck as far as the jobs go here well, well if, you, if you think about it, if you move a factory to China with a thousand jobs, okay, that's an, that's an issue for today, okay? However, if you give a technology to China, say, for better windmills, for wind power, then, you know, we're giving away the jobs of tomorrow. And, you know, the, the national authorities, our national security people, have some idea as to what's going on out in Ann Arbor. Mm. And a, a, the University of Michigan, Mary Sue Coleman in particular, was asked to be briefed by these national security authorities. Can we come around and tell you the dangers that you're getting into? These national security people did the same thing with major Northeastern universities, and it was written up in the New York Times. Well, Mary Sue Coleman declined the invitation to receive these people. And also, we've heard from national security people that on occasion when they go onto campus to try to find out what's going on and observe the situation, that they have received the wrath of the university. The university calls up and says, quit intimidating our people on campus by coming around and you're not welcome. I find it shocking that our authorities <clears throat> can be bullied 
by the University of Michigan. Okay? And the University of Michigan should be glad to work in partnership with these people who know about the security of our nation. Well, I would think so. It's almost like the, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, saying uh, to the federal government that uh, uh, we aren't going to open our books. <laughs> well, and, and, and when we try to use uh, uh, sunshine laws like the Freedom of Information Act, mm -hmm. the university plays all kinds of games trying to hide that information. And, and the university has even uh, uh, made arguments in court that it's essentially above any law written by the state legislature because they're a separate constitutionally uh, mandated entity. They're a so, sovereignty, and, uh, right. kind of like. So, you know. so like when they were accused of violating the Open Meetings Act, one of their defenses was, well, you know, we aren't subject to that because we are, you know, we are, you know the legislature can't pass such a law to affect us because we are a constitutional entity. So the university is very arrogant about being able to keep its secrets. And the other thing you, know, you notice about the university and the spin-off companies, there's a lot of government subsidies, Ann Arbor Spark, <coughs> okay, MEDC, and you hear about all these companies that are created and, and you look at how much money was spent. And one of the things you ask, what's the cost-benefit ratio? You know, people really got upset by ADC, aid to dependent children. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have ADC, but it's aid to dependent corporations. And you really look at what good is being done by this massive welfare that's being showered on the, on the university and these spin-off companies. Mm -hmm. How many of them have amounted to something? And Doug mentioned the, 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 the firm Dicera that came from Ardesta and, and this invention in the Department of Electrical Engineering. Well, it was actually set up in San Jose, California. So how does that help us here in Michigan to have a spin-off from the university go that far Out away? There. Mm -hmm. I agree. But, um, and I'm, I'm very curious about how we got a new governor here in Michigan that is kind of tied in with all of this stuff and, uh, and that he's not um, being straightforward in his uh, delivery to the Michigan public uh, about the, uh, the security issues, you know, the, 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 the employment issues here in America, the, uh, the, the national security issues of sending this technology elsewhere. And uh, this may be something that we can get into in the next part of the segment here uh, for uh, right now. I want to thank you for joining us for this first half of the show, and uh, we'll be back in about another uh, minute. Thank you. The Center for Judicial Accountability is on a mission to improve the quality of our judiciary. This is an organization dedicated to removing political consideration from the judicial selection process and ensuring that corrupt judges are properly disciplined and removed. Why shouldn't judges like everyone else be responsible for their incompetence and deliberate misdeeds? Why should judges be allowed to run their courtrooms as their own private fiefdom, free to abuse litigants and lawyers who come before them? We are building a national organization focused on the problem of bad judges, judges who are incompetent, abusive, and dishonest. By dishonesty, we mean judges who knowingly disregard clear and controlling law and who write decisions which fabricate or deliberately omit critical facts. These judges destroy people's lives, families, and businesses, and for ulterior reasons, torpedo important cases affecting the public. The financial cost of appealing a judge's bad decision puts appeal out of reach for the average citizen. Yet those who make the financial sacrifice and do appeal often meet with the same realities on the appellate court level as in the lower court. Even where appellate courts reverse a lower court's blatantly erroneous decision, there is no personal cost to the judge for his judicial malpractice, but only to the litigants who have been wronged and to the system. Incompetent, abusive, and corrupt judges create havoc at the trial level and overwhelm the system with otherwise needless appeals. This puts the courts in crisis and is extremely costly to taxpayers. Obviously, improving the way we choose judges is critical, whether by election or appointment. There must be safeguards to ensure that only persons of the highest competence, integrity, and judicial temperament become our judges. The Center for Judicial Accountability 
is one of those.